Hello everyone and welcome to the STEM high level event bringing research into the classroom. Today is the second day of the event. My name is Noel Billon and I'm coordinating UPenn SchoolNet activities in the Brightec project. You will hear more about this project again during the event today, but first let me introduce briefly who is in the room. Together with us, Today in the online room, we have my colleague Rute Batista, who will be supporting this event from a technical point of view. So if you have any issues with your audio or connection, please do not hesitate to send her a message in the question and answer window. But most importantly, it is with great pleasure that I will soon be welcoming our speakers for today, who are teachers, researchers, but also representatives of STEM organizations, companies from different countries in Europe. They all agree to share with you their experience, our research finding about citizen science and how it can be integrated in the classroom. Thank you so much to them for being here and presenting today. Now let me continue with some technical aspects. As yesterday, you will see a question and answer window in your screen. If you don't see it, make sure to open it because we will be sharing useful information and links with you there throughout the event. Also, as this is an interactive event, please feel free to share your questions to speakers in this window. We will be collecting them and address them to the speakers towards the end of each presentation. The Brightec and some other projects uh, co-organizing the event today are financed by the Erasmus Plus program. So for the event to be considered eligible, we must provide to the European Commission the full name and address of all participants. So for this, I kindly ask you and all the speakers to go to sign the participants list of the event through the link that is shown in the question and answer panel. This will only take you two minutes to fill it in and you only to fill it once during today's session. As you saw, five different projects are co-organizing the event today. Bright Tech, CS Track, STEM Alliance, Scientix, and Amgen Teach. All of them very active in STEM education and bringing the research and education world closer together. So yesterday we had some presentation about Bright Tech and Amgen Teach, and today you will hear more also about the CS Track project and the STEM Alliance during the event. But why are we interested in such initiative at European SchoolNet? UPenn SchoolNet is coordinating uh, Brightex Bright responsibilities. And UN is a network of 32 ministries of education in Europe based in Brussels, which aims to bring, you know, bring innovation in teaching and learning to key stakeholders, ministries of education, schools, teachers, researchers, and industry partners. STEM is one of UPenn SchoolNet major thematic domains, and UN have been involved in more than 30 STEM education initiatives financed through UPenn SchoolNet members, industry partners, or by UPenn Union's funding program. As part of these initiatives, uh, we will present some of you, some of them today. And as a network of 32 ministries of education, Europe and SchoolNet receives the mandate of its ministries to reflect how we can fight against this disinterest of young students for taking up STEM studies and later on taking up STEM jobs. In that context, through our various projects, among which the Bright Tech project, we are developing activities enabling us to collect evidence and data on which our ministries can base policy recommendations. Scientix is a European portal for the community of science education in Europe funded by DG Research. It is one of the flagship initiatives managed by European SchoolNet. There are also other particular initiatives such as the STEM Alliance that I mentioned before, which is a public and private initiative associating both ministries of education and companies in order to work and reflect about the importance of contextualization of STEM teaching and contributing therefore to make science teaching more attractive for young students. You will hear more about this project today. As mentioned earlier, several projects interested in promoting STEM education and in particular bringing research into the classroom or co-organizing co this event today. So I would like now to give the floor to two representatives of the CS Track project, Otto Sabel, university teachers, and Dr. Patricia Santos, senior researchers and project manager in charge of building a database of CS projects in the CS Track projects. Patricia, Otto, good morning and welcome to the event. The floor is yours. 
Many thanks for, for the introduction, Noel. It's a pleasure to, to present here today and to represent the, the CSTRACT project. This presentation has uh, two parts. Let me see. I think that there is a still a delay. I cannot move my slides, but I hope that very soon I will move them. Let me see now. So, so this presentation has uh, two parts. Uh, first, I'm going to present the part done by by the UPF team, uh, the, techno uh, the Educational Technologies Research Group in, in Barcelona. This uh, work has been led by myself, Patricia Santos, and uh, Miriam Calvera. Uh, this presentation summarizes relevant work during the first 15 months of the CSTRAC project. So, so this is the content for the presentation today, but uh, considering the interesting presentations from yesterday, I think the audience is very familiar with the benefits of citizen science in education and, and the main challenges. So I go directly to introduce uh, the, the CSTRACT project. CSTRACT is a European research project uh, of the program H2020. This is a three years project uh, has a duration of three years and it combines methods of social sciences, humanities and computer science to expand the knowledge of citizen science. Uh, in, in this context, uh, uh, we are one of the main goals uh, has been to compile a, a database of citizen science projects from European and H2020 associated countries, mainly visible on the web. Uh, as you know, there is a large amount of citizen science initi initiatives around the world, uh, but uh, it is a challenge to have access to them. No, so something that that we are aiming is to develop a central point of access uh, for that can be very useful for different communities of interest, but especially for for the education community. So. This, this is a summary of the technical work done to implement this database during the first half of the project. I'm not going to enter into detail, but it represents mainly the process that we have followed where it has been a complex technical problem uh, process uh, where we have implemented a technical infrastructure and, and we have identified the main categories and descriptors to report information of citizen science projects. So we have followed the main standard in citizen science, the PPSR, to, to categorize this information. And, and we also, what we did is to identify relevant websites and citizen science platforms to, to extract data from them and to fill our database with information from, from existing citizen science projects. So the result, the first result is this first version of the database. This version contains 4,520 uh, citizen science projects from 53 different uh, platforms. I have to clarify that this database is not of public access due to privacy and security issues, but something that we are doing is that we are developing interactive dashboards, as for instance, this one that I can share your slides with you if you want to access to the dashboard and you can interact and play with information. So, so our aim is that the information, a digested version of the information will be open to the community uh, to, to play and to interact with the information. And, and something that we plan as well is to increase the information uh, until the end of the project, having more projects in the database um, and more information. In this line, something that, that uh, we are doing is that uh, in the context also of the PhD thesis from Miriam, uh, something that we are doing is that we want to co-design with teachers and students an interactive dashboard useful for them uh, to, to play with data from citizen science projects, but with educational uh, purposes. So something that we plan to do uh, during the next months, during, 20, 20, during this year and, and next year, 
is to organize co-design workshops with students and teachers to understand their needs and, and to understand which is the meaningful information for them in the context of citizen science to use with educational purposes. Something that uh, we have uh, already investigated is the connection of SDGs with citizen science. So, for instance, here you can see an example of a, uh, of a dashboard that connects information from the Sustainable Development Goals with information from existing uh, citizen science projects. So then, uh, as I have said, our next steps is to uh, develop different co-design workshops with teachers and students. So please, if you are interested in being a beta tester, contact us and, and we will be happy to, to collaborate with you and, and to involve you in, in our co-design workshops. So we think that uh, this dashboard will have the potential to help teachers and students to have access to a large amount of information from citizen science projects and to use this information with, with educational purposes. So this has been my part and it's my pleasure now to introduce Otto. He will continue with with second part of, of this presentation. Thank you. Uh, Patrice, it's a great pleasure to be here. Every, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Otto from uh, Uvascula, and I will continue with the. Uh, um, let's see if I. Request. <laughs> Yes, now I should be alive, <laughs> I guess. So everybody, hey, thank you for, for having this possibility that I could show you some early first results of our survey. The CS track survey was constructed uh, to have a, let's see, I wonder if I have to control that because. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> it seems that my control is waiting. But anyways, the, the question is about excellent. Um, to see a track survey, which is a European wide, very largely uh, distributed survey. And if you as a CS uh, citizen science practitioner have not participated in it. Take a picture of that and connect uh, uh, to the survey and you are still available to participate in it. So we have early resu results of the project uh, which actually show some of the interesting things uh, that I I'm now addressing. The survey has been done and executed or actually prepared uh, based on research, uh, published research, as well as high level experts and practitioners that, who have very uh, good uh, experience for many years on, in the actual performance of citizen science. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, the main kind of results uh, show that uh, the teams, uh, for example, the, we have a uh, uh, quite well uh, represented all 30 countries, uh, different countries in Europe, also from uh, different place, places of the world. We have quite good uh, representation of both uh, uh, males and females. And there was the main parts of the participants who actually have participated in an long-term uh, citizen science uh, practice are within the 31 to 60, 70 years old. Uh, what has happened in, in the practice is actually, uh, you can see that maybe in the next slide, uh, quite interestingly, when you correspond the engagement and years from the left uh, uh, parallel sections, first year, second, two to five years, six to ten years, and 
over 10 years. You can see that the uses of our practice of citizen science is quite long uh, uh, participation in the, in the practice. And also when you see it on the horizontal level, uh, the question of are you participating in just irregularly once every week, uh, occasionally like every month, uh, once every few months or once in a year. You can see in the hotspot of that that mostly uh, participants have participated weekly and over 10 years of period, which is uh, shows a very high level of engagement. In the next slide, the question of, of engagement, that why do people engage in the citizen science practices? Uh, so the interest of team, you have something found that is very interesting to yourself, your practice, uh, your hobbies and so forth, as well as contributing to uh, scientific research is a very significant issue. And for yourself is the opportunity to learn. Quite interesting, the use of technology is very high level. 77% of participants use their own smartphone for, from when practicing the CS or citizen science activities, which is used for collecting, of course, and finding information and communication as well. Uh, in the next slide, you uh, find the initial results on the learning side, and this is quite relevant uh, from many perspectives to school nets and, and the schools itself, as well as the high level of <laughs> in, uh, pa uh, participants in the wor working environments in terms of continuous education, for example. Uh, they have quite good understanding of scientific topics and processes, so the engagement, of course, uh, develops that kind of skills. But moreover, what is learned during the CS activities? Interaction skills, when you have to interact in collaboration with other people. Also finding information, either the particulars of birds or butterflies and so forth. But also reflecting when you have, you are in community, so it, it reflection process in, in terms of uh, activating collaboration and, and the task, re reaching the ends of tasks is, is highly relevant. So the skills and competencies are critical thinking, collaboration, communication and inf information literacy. In the next, uh, we see the uh, characteristics of the social economic background, which also talks quite uh, frankly on, on the need for continuous education. The education level is quite high, as well as most people are participating are employed or pensioners, and they have quite good income, which also leads to the next slide's idea that uh, the distribution of educational background uh, has to levels, I would say, to, to this, um, tops in this distribution. And in the end, next level, next slide, <laughs> sorry. Uh, to conclude, uh, what kind of ideas do we have uh, found in our re uh, survey? That has a strong impact into an educational field or, or uh, in the schools. First of all, the citizen science can create a strong engagement and commitment in the practices. And also the themes of interest, the scientific contribution and opportunities of learning is really highly relevant in the practice of it. Uh, moreover, the use of rich ways of using technology uh, in collecting and various different practices, which in a sense also connects the interaction skills information search, reflective skills, when the practitioners are using critical thinking and collaboration skills in their projects. And the end, I would say, uh, this is our team. And again, you can take the slide <laughs> picture and participate in the conference. Uh, in the next slides, I would like to uh, say our thank yous for, for the presentation, opportunity to be here. And finally, I would emphasize that the results, the next slide, 
shows the results you can find from the CS track projects. So please do sub subscribe to our monthly newsletter and follow us in the Twitter. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Patricia and Otto, for this introduction to citizen science and these interesting resources developed through the CS Track project. I actually respond to some of the comments that we received in the chat on how the uh, participants can engage with citizen science activities. So I believe that your, your CS Track will provide a, uh, interesting uh, resources regarding that and for participants. Um, and now that we looked actually at some theoretical aspects behind citizen science education, let's hear the feedback from a practical case study that was conducted under the Brightech project in Poland on monitoring of seasonal changes of riparian vegetation and river microclimates. So for this, I have the pleasure to welcome uh, Monika Kalinowska and Agata Godze, coordinator of Brightech. Agata. Monica, are you with us? Yes, but uh, this is not my slides. I mean, this is the part of Agatha I've seen. Okay, well, I guess Agatha, you go first. That okay? Uh, no, it's better in in uh, <laughs> because she will continue. So it's better if you can start with my own slide slides. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Monika Kalinowska. I'm from Institute of Geophysics, Polish Academy of Sciences. And together with my colleague Agata Gostik, uh, we are going to uh, to talk. Uh, are you hearing me? Because I'm receiving some messages. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, OK, OK. So we are going to talk about the citizen science education uh, in classroom case study on monitoring of seasonal changes of riparian vegetation and microclimate uh, conditions. I don't know it's working or I should be patient or I will try. OK, OK. Uh, so I'm scientist in hydrology and hydrodynamic department uh, and I had the pleasure to to be responsible for one of the pilot actions in the Brightech project uh, and uh, the pilot was dedicated to observing of seasonal changes of uh, of uh, river riparian vegetation and also in some cases also the river microclimate conditions. Uh, but before I will talk about the pilot, let me mention why the vegetation is so important. So the vegetation is commonly present in rivers and channels, as you may notice also on those nice Narev river photos. And the presence of vegetation in the channel to a large extent uh, influence uh, the, the, the water flow, uh, the, the all mixing and transport processes, river morphodynamics, uh, water quality, ecology. Uh, practically, it means everything what is happening in the channel, but also what is happening outside channel even far away. I mean, the agriculture, the, the urban development, infrastructure and so on. What I am um, uh, interested, the most interested in is how the, the, the vegetation influence the water flow and transport of substance that could be, for example, different kind of the pollutants. Since in my job I'm working on the computers models, computer programs, uh, that can be used for uh, helping us to understand how the, how the pollutants may spread in the river after for example, accident or, or some other introducing them into the into the water. Here you can see the example of such computer simulation for uh, Vistula River in Krakow with some instant news release of the pollutants. And to create, to, to, to implement such models, we need to know many, many, many coefficients, many parameters uh, before and uh, some of them uh, may be established only using uh, of so-called tracer experiments. And here you can see the example of such tracer experiment, uh, also with the presence of the students from one, one of the primary school from the Brightech projects. Uh, in this kind of experiments, we are putting the 
colorant, here the rhodamine, to the water. This is the environment, environmentally safe dye, uh, and after releasing them it to the water, we are observing how fast uh, and, and how it gets transformed downstream. Practically, we are measuring, let's say, the color of the water, and based on the measurements, we are able to establish mentioned parameters, coefficients, and later use them uh, while we are implementing or creating the, 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 the models. But to understand how the vegetation influences different processes and when and where to conduct such experiments, we actually need a lot of observation. A lot of observation, a lot of measurements, and here uh, we, need to need, we need to know uh, what is happening between these two border conditions. I mean, the condition with no vegetation and the condition when the vegetation is fully developed and the, the channel is fully vegetated. And in such cases, this kind of the citizen science project, the help of schools and pupils can be very beneficial for us. Uh, one thing is that they can help to save our scientists' time. The other thing is that uh, that we can make this kind of observation on the much larger scale. And in case of the river pilot in the Brightec project, uh, nine schools took a part in the project. They observed 10 rivers and at, at 11 locations. And uh, we actually had a lot of data from different parts of Poland. And uh, despite this very difficult uh, coronavirus uh, situation, some of schools were able to continue the observation because it was quite difficult because schools were closed. And uh, But in those cases when children live nearby the, the selected uh, area for observation, uh, they were able to continue this observation. Uh, children were monitoring uh, river and vegetation uh, mostly by taking the uh, photographs of the selected uh, channel or river at specific intervals. And uh, it was quite easy for them because they used simple um, cameras like uh, the cell phone cameras of course, after uh, proper instructions and uh, and uh, tests that we made during the school visits. Some of schools uh, actually depending on the pupil's age, but also on the possibilities of the particular schools, also made for us some hydrological and meteorological measurements. Uh, and all those data um, have been, I don't know what's happening. Something is happening here. OK, OK, all those data, uh, the photos, the information about the location the, and condition on the, of, of, of river together with, with all measurements like, for example, water level, water flow or, or some meteorological data uh, have been sent to me uh, using especially prepared to uh, during the, the school visit uh, online form. Here you can see the example. This is, of course, in the native language, in the Polish language. Uh, for each school, we had uh, separated, uh, separated uh, forms since uh, they submitted different kinds of data. And uh, before I will give the voice to, to Agata, uh, I would like to show you the example of the photo monitoring. Uh, here there are selected uh, photos of the, the taken for the Warszawicki canal. This is the small channel. Uh, the, the photos and all the monitoring have been done by the primary school. So I'm especially proud of this because uh, it's not always connected. The quality of data you obtain, it's not always connected with the age of the puppies. What's, uh, what is uh, uh, maybe surprising or maybe not. So, uh, uh, despite the, the, the situation of the coronavirus, some of school were able to continue uh, the monitoring and uh, some of data uh, we uh, also used in our uh, scientific uh, proposal submitted. Uh, those data have, be, have, have been used as a part of our uh, preliminary research. So, I 
I'm very happy that I had a chance to take a part in the Brightech project, and and I hope I will uh, I will try to use this kind of the cooperation in my future research work. Thank you very much, Agata. Will continue. Yes, thank you very much, and uh, I will ask for for my slides, and I will. I will uh, spread a word about uh, preparations and the collaboration with teachers, as Monica mainly uh, focused on uh, on research work. And now we will uh, we will concentrate a little bit on on this collaboration with uh, teachers. So uh, we um, our preparations were uh, implemented in two steps. So. We know that in order to be able to work together with students and teachers, we need to focus a lot on the training. Uh, so the training of um, was done in two steps. First, uh, we organized a half day workshop for teachers uh, with Monika uh, in our premises, and we wanted to uh, present the aims of the analysis and the scientific background, but also give some technical uh, instructions and uh, preliminary select the channels for observation. And uh, as the next step, uh, Monika visited schools uh, which uh, would like to participate in the pilot. And uh, Monika was uh, working together with students. So um, they together they visited uh, selected observation points. Uh, they decided on what kind of meteorological and hydrodynamic observations uh, are possible to conduct, taking into account the situation of the school. And also they decided on the format on the online uh, forms, which each school will uh, prepare and send uh, based on the observations. Uh, also, it was uh, an occasion to hear uh, these um, aims of analysis and scientific background in a popular way, in an easy language uh, appropriate for, uh, for schools teach, uh, students. Altogether, we had seven schools in November 2019, and uh, during the assessment of that, all teachers were very pleased about the visits. Uh, there were, of course, some organizational challenges uh, like coordination of place and time, and especially if students were from various uh, groups, uh, then the coordination was uh, extremely important to gather all the groups together for, for this um, first lecture and then uh, the trip to the river. And visit to the river is also a kind of, of uh, organizational uh, challenge. Uh, however, uh, all teachers assess that positively because it helped them, uh, it helped students to understand the research topic and how the pro uh, pilot will be implemented. Uh, they also assessed very positively the direct contact with the scientists and friendly atmosphere. And we observed that uh, students uh, who took part in, in this visit were much higher motivated to, to conduct measurements in future. Uh, we also gathered some teachers' perspective as regards the whole pilot, not only the, the school visits. And um, based on the focus group interview that we had with uh, all the teachers involved in the pilots, uh, uh, they appreciated uh, good organization of work and they felt that students were working independently. Um, in some cases, they asked students uh, about uh, how they liked uh, the pilot and other methods implemented during the whole school year. And um, they were very pleased to see that uh, these field measurements were indicated as one of the best methods, uh, the didactic methods implemented over the, the whole year. Uh, definitely, they also appreciated this learning by doing aspect. And we may say that it's place-based education methods um, also, um, something that was uh, of, of big value for, for parents as well, that smartphones are a measuring tool, not only a playing device, so it could be used for scientific purposes. And many teachers said also that it was fun for them. And now let's hear... Uh, there are many benefits of citizen science applied for school practice. First of all, the biggest advantage is showing students that the science can be for them. Research requires plan and method which doesn't have to be too difficult for students. 
a success depends on hard work defined rather by work discipline than by high math. They could learn the research method in practice. They figured out how to collect data properly, how to present them. Students could make their own methods of measurement, for example, river depth or velocity field, what improved their creativity. Moreover, pupils could see the science doesn't have to be made in a big laboratory somewhere in the world, but also close to them, even in small village. It can raise students' self-esteem because they see that their small river can be important from scientific point of view for somebody. It improves the responsibility for our neighborhood. Finally, the citizen science approach is a fresh wind in school routine. Students can see school as a place where modern things ha can happen. The research applied in school shows students the way of looking for more than facts in a school's book. So we heard a testimony from one of the teachers in implementing uh, the pilots uh, in Selina uh, school. And two, two last slides about some challenges. So COVID-19 was already mentioned by Monica, but also some teachers um, had some problems with safety procedures. Is it uh, necessary to have a uh, lifeguard accompanying the, the trip or not? And we also had, um, they had some problems with transportation if the distance to the river was lo longer than walking distance. Um, as for the benefits, um, we believe that uh, pupils learned how seasons affect the river vegetation and macroclimate river. Uh, they learned how commonly used electronic devices may produce variable uh, scientific results. And uh, they had a chance to uh, gather and analyze, analyze scientific data. For researchers, we get information on the seasonal changes in ribbon from various locations. We could collaborate with uh, local communities. It was especially crucial for future investigation and experiments, uh, like for instance, these tracer experiments showed by Monika in Warszawice. And they had a chance to communicate research aims and results to society. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Monica and Agata, for sharing this experience of citizen science pilot conducted in the Brightech project. Now, I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Christos Gianaros, who is a research associate from the National Observatory in Greece, so he can tell us more about the opportunities and challenges related to citizen science education from a researcher's perspective. Christos, okay, the floor is yours. Hello. Yeah, hello. Uh, so let's wait for my presentation. Okay. So, hello everyone. My name is uh, Christos Giannaros and I'm a research associate at the National Observatory of Athens. Uh, my work focuses on meteorology and numerical weather prediction applications. And today I will speak about my experience in the framework of the Brightech project, during which an attempt of introducing my research work to, into the classroom was made. I will also try to highlight the opportunities and challenges uh, of citizen science education, at least from my research point of view, and I hope that the information I will provide uh, will be useful. So during uh, my participation in the Brightec project, we focused on high temperature weather, particularly at the urban scale. This is because of the urban heat island effect, which refers to the excess warmth of cities compared to the rural surroundings. As can be seen in, uh, in the left image, uh, temperature in a city can be higher by 3 to 4 or even 10 degrees Celsius in some urban areas compared to the countryside. This fact leads to higher levels of human thermal uh, discomfort for the urban residents, especially during heat wave periods. The greater levels of uh, human thermal discomfort is, uh, for the urban dwellers is more evidence in the course of the night when the human body expected to relax and release heat, but the elevated temperatures do not allow this process to take place. 
As a result, the human body is thermally strained and this strain can lead to several heat-related illnesses such as headache or even to death uh, due to cardiovascular and respiratory means functions. The urban heat island effect is a highly localized phenomenon, so being capable of mapping the urban thermal conditions at very fine spatial resolutions is of vital importance. For example, this allows for uh, identifying cool spots where uh, citizens can uh, uh, experience thermal relief during extreme hot days. So in this direction, citizen science environmental mo uh, monitoring can be uh, very valuable. Uh, so, in the framework of uh, the research problem that I briefly explained, the Brightec project provided me the opportunity to conduct a field experiment for studying the urban microclimate and human thermal comfort conditions in a public school and its surrounding areas located at Vrilisia in Attica, Greece, in collaboration with uh, the students and teachers of the school. The experiment involved measuring and uh, recording the meteorological and physiological factors associated with the human thermal comfort conditions by the students in seven spots in and around the school as shown in uh, the left image. Each spot was characterized by different features. Uh, for example, we had one shaded place in the park and one sunny spot uh, in the street. Uh, the meteorological variables, uh, the air temperature and humidity and the wind speed were measured by a pocket weather meter, while the observation of cloud cover was used as a proxy for the fourth necessary variable which is associated with uh, radiation. Concerning the physiological factors, the students recorded in an anonymous questionnaire their activity, for example, uh, standing, their clothing, for example, light summer clothes, and some personal information such as their age and uh, gender. These are important information as uh, higher levels of activity and clothing insulation lead to greater levels of human thermal stress. While it is well documented that uh, particular population subjects, uh, such as the women, um, are subject to greater thermal uh, heat related uh, risks. So, uh, two different individuals may perceive differently the thermal environment under the same weather. For this, the anonymous questionnaire was also used by the students in order to record their subjective thermal cessation in each measuring spot. In the end, the students followed a guided procedure adapted to their knowledge and uh, skills level for processing the data and answering specific research questions concerning the human thermal comfort conditions. This process was coordinated by the teachers and a conclusions report was prepared by the students. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 situation, we performed the experiment only once during November of 2019. Even the plan was to repeat the experiment in spring and summer in order to account for seasonality. So the outcomes of the experiment are partially limited. Uh, however, the results presented by the students showed that they were capable of understanding the studied topic. Uh, most importantly, they were capable of and interested in following a research methodological framework for uh, uh, collecting and processing data and drawing conclusions based on this data. Considering the whole picture, I could describe the uh, conducted work as a pilot for larger scale projects. For example, uh, several schools could be involved in the future in Athens, Greece or in any other urban area. The students of each school could gather the necessary data at least once per month throughout a year. In this way, a large data set could be created that could be used for uh, studying the uh, urban microclimate and human thermal comfort conditions in several places within a city. I believe that such project can be very beneficial for the students, providing them the opportunity to understand the practical utility of learned theories, to expand their knowledge and skills and be more aware and active uh, in terms of environmental protection. Uh, from the researcher's perspective, if I had to create such a large data set on my own, it would be very difficult. Having the assistance of uh, the students in data collection, as well as the assistance of teachers in uh, uh, coordinating the project's actions, would make things a lot easier accelerating the research process. Also, citizen science education provides the opportunity to understand how people and especially young people perceive our research. I believe that this is an important aspect, especially for uh, research fields that involve a direct interaction with society. 
For example, in meteorological and environmental sciences, we communicate several outcomes to the general public on a daily basis, from the weather forecasts of the next days to the impacts of climate change that we expect in the following years. So it is important to have a proper communication strategy and adapt if necessary our dissemination actions in order to better inform and serve society. In terms of research equipment, low-cost monitoring devices uh, could be provided to the students in the framework of the large-scale project I mentioned earlier. Also, students could be involved in the process of building their own mini weather station as in the right image with the assistance of their technology and physical sciences uh, teachers. This hands-on experience could be very beneficial for them considering the rise of open technologies and uh, computing programming in several sectors. Actually, there is a growing interest in my research field for extensive deployment of citizen science and or crowdsource sensors and devices. Uh, wearable tools as in the middle image uh, as well as smart gadgets are also considered. Uh, as I mentioned before, such tools can provide uh, a researcher with huge amounts of data at very fine spatial and temporal resolutions. Data that without citizen science, it would be very difficult to be acquired. For example, the photos on uh, the left are taken by people through their smartphones in the framework of the Crowdwater project. And a virtual gauge meter is used for estimating the water level in the rivers. Concerning uh, challenges in citizen science education, I would place students' motivation and participation first. In my case, I try to gain students' attention and interest during a preparatory interactive lecture in the beginning of the project to introduce the scientific problem and research questions. I gave emphasis on uh, the climate crisis emerging issues, uh, referring to iconic figures for teenagers such as Greta Thunberg. I also used real-world problems to highlight the societal value of the research that we were going to undertake. For example, I referred to the 2022 World Football Cup uh, that will take place in Qatar, and it is the first football event that will take place uh, during the winter period, as a scientific study demonstrated that if the Cup would took place traditionally in the summer, the thermal stress conditions would be extremely dangerous for the players and also for the attendees. Another effective way to address this challenge uh, could be the introduction of the uh, research project as a game. For example, the Crowdwater project I mentioned earlier util utilizes an application where the users upload their photos of river levels and they earn virtual badges and actual prizes uh, such as hats and bags according to their activity. Teachers can also assist uh, on the proper participation of students in a research project. Most importantly, they can facilitate the adaptation and incorporation of a research project in the standard school program. This is crucial because the whole process must be beneficial for the students. It's an interactive process in which students which, uh, should be provided with the opportunity to gain actionable knowledge and broaden their horizons. Uh, beyond the challenge, this fact can be considered uh, also as a particularity of citizen science education compared to the traditional uh, citizen science. Data quality is another uh, challenge needed to be addressed. In this direction, several tools and methods have been developed in recent years for data quality control and screening in order to assure reliability and validity. Uh, further ethics issues are of great importance, especially due to the uh, students' involvement. For example, wearable monitoring devices uh, may track the location of students or a research project may require some personal information of the students, such uh, like in my case. So it is important any research project to be adapted in order to include the personalization protocols and uh, through to respect the data rights of the participants and the general data protection uh, regulations. Finally, I would like to focus on a key citizen science uh, issue, the communication between researchers and teachers, which can be considered as both an opportunity and a challenge. It is an opportunity as a teacher can act as a research assistant in uh, coordinating a project as well as during the implementation of the project, including the data collection and quality control. 
Vice versa, a researcher can act as a classroom assistant, providing a framework for pedagogical activities related to the classroom's learning background. However, in order this interaction, uh, this interaction to be realized, it is important, uh, it is necessary an effective communication between a uh, researcher and teacher. This means that a common understanding of the project uh, will be in place from the beginning. Uh, in this direction, a discussion before the project starts uh, can be very useful uh, as it provides the opportunity to co-shape the project's goals, uh, considering both the research and pedagogical value. Exchange of material information is also important. For example, I shared my preliminary lectures presentation with the teachers in order to discuss it further with uh, the students. Uh, a frequent communication through email or phone can be very helpful during the uh, implementation of the project. And uh, in the same direction, online collaboration tools uh, can assist the effective communication during uh, the project. In the framework of uh, Brightech, um, a citizen science toolkit is provided in the link as also mentioned uh, yesterday, including various suggestions for tools that can be used uh, during the creation and implementation of a citizen science project. In overall, I had a great experience during my participation in the Brightech uh, project. I believe that citizen science education uh, provides significant opportunities in uh, various uh, research fields with any challenge that may emerge being manageable. During the Brightech project, I had a very good collaboration with the schools and I believe that the conductive work was successful at the pilot level. So I look forward for future projects and I also encourage any researcher to actively be involved in uh, citizen science education. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing your experience as a researcher and also for highlighting how students can actually help accelerating the research process, as you mentioned, and how these activities are also beneficial for, for your students as well. So although citizen science is a splendid vehicle for promoting science in education, while also bringing many benefits to society, it also brings some challenges. For example, there are also uh, some ethical issues connected with it that should not be omitted. So these ethical issues can be related to uh, four points, data quality, data sharing and intellectual property, potential conflicts of interest, exploitation. But in this record, and in order to tell you more about data quality, I have the pleasure Pleasure to welcome Mike Sturken from the Citizen Science Liaison, Kiyu Leuven, also Citizen Science Advisor. I will tell you more about the opportunities and accurateness of the data gathered by Citizen Science Project. Mike, how are you today? I'm fine, thanks. Welcome to the event and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Noel. Thank you for this uh, nice introduction and thanks for inviting me. Um, as Noel already said, I'm going to uh, focus on uh, the aspect of data in citizen science. And as she also explained, um, data has a lot of uh, aspects, but I'm for this, the next 15 minutes, I'm really going to focus on the aspect of data quality and just give a comprehensive overview. Um, before I start uh, on giving the overview on uh, data quality, I do want to pinpoint to an important note concerning citizen science in general, um, because it has an influence on how you uh, approach your data. Um, so citizen science in general boil, boils down to um, people doing scientific activities with the help of scientists or uh, nearly professional scientists, people with a lot of knowledge about science. So the, as the, the aspect of scientific knowledge is actually the thing that is always present in a citizen science project. Now, um, every project also inherently contains an educational aspect, most of the time informally, because people who are joining a citizen science project are um, always learning something. Um, and uh, most of the projects, not all of them, but most of the projects also inherently have a societal impact aspect, um, it, which you also can call an activism aspect. Now, each of these aspects are um, can be present in, in a citizen science project, but it is actually up to you as a project owner to choose which of these aspects gets more attention or is the most important 
part of your citizen science project. And in this slide, I have added um, so the, the aspects in general, and then also the um, the activities that people can do to um, add to these the quality of these aspects. And in red, you can see the motivations of the participants because uh, every type of citizen science project has different um, participants with different motivations to contribute. So some people are very interested in uh, contributing to real science. Other people are very uh, worried about, for instance, the environment, um, and that's the main reason why they want to join. And then other people like, for instance, teachers and students are very much interested in the educational aspect of it. And of course, uh, the educational aspect can be informal and in the most like in the latest uh, year, actually, um, citizen science informal education has been growing tremendously and Brightech has been uh, part of that. Um, so as I said, you can choose which aspect is the most important one in your uh, project and um, depending on those choices, your data quality will also be slightly different. Um, this choice is deliberate, it's free and you always have to take care of the motivation of the people who are joining. In this presentation, of course, as I said, uh, I will focus on the aspect of data and uh, let's have a look. Um, even though citizen science is gaining momentum a lot in the scientific world, scientists are still often very suspicious about the data because they are wondering whether they can trust the data that they retrieve. Um, sometimes scientists are, um, are uh, worried about, for instance, um, whether people are registering the observations or are, whether they are doing it well, which could have to do with, for, for instance, the mindset or the motivation of the people. Um, sometimes observations can be done randomly and uh, not in a systematic way, so this is more uh, steered by coincidence. Sometimes people can have a different interpretation on the same observation, so they have to learn about what the difference is between observations and interpretations. And sometimes people just make mistakes, everybody does. And um, so it could be, for instance, if they are uh, spotting certain species that they are not recognizing or registering certain species because they don't simply don't have the knowledge that they need to recognize those. Fortunately, for each of these pitfalls, there are remedies to uh, counteract those um, and that can help improve the data quality. So one of the remedies is focusing on the numbers, is replicating your observations, and I will go deeper into each of these remedies in a few minutes. Um, another one is uh, making sure you have large sample sizes. Um, then you can also dive into the protocol in itself by including peer review, pro uh, peer review process in your protocol. And of course, you can focus on education to improve the knowledge that people need uh, in order to perform the scientific activities. So um, replications, uh, this is something that happens all the time in citizen science projects. And I'm just pointing to a little example of the Radio Meteor Zoo project. This um, project is present on the platform Zooniverse. Um, it's also one of the projects that has been uh, joining our Belgian Brightech uh, pilots. So you can find more details of this project on uh, the website of Brightech. Here you can see um, a spectrogram and this spectrogram has on the X axis uh, time. So this is going from zero to five minutes. And on the Y axis, you have the frequency of a radio signal. And it's a radio signal that is actually emitted by a beacon that is positioned somewhere in Belgium, in the south of Belgium. And the signal is being um, sent into space, reflected on a meteor, and then the reflected signal is uh, captured by uh, a receiver positioned somewhere else in Belgium. Now, um, the frequency of this signal can change um, due to the Doppler effect. And these, um, yeah, these aspects are actually plotted in, in such a spectrogram. So what you see here is um, stripes. So the ver vertical stripes are actually um, signals of meteors that have been in, this, in the sky um, for a very short moment, a fraction of a second, while the signal that you can see over here is actually um, an airplane flying by. So what the project asks to the uh, 
people who are joining it is to um, draw rectangles around each signal that they can visually discern um, in order to train an artificial intelligence mechanism uh, so that the computer can actually learn how to recognize signals of um, meteors uh, and uh, yeah so the algorithm can um, automatically analyze the spectrograms in, on the long term. So what did they do to um, make sure that that yeah because everybody has a different view on how big the rectangle should be around um, one signal. So um, to avoid uh, bias by this they uh, actually presented every picture um, ten, to 10 different participants so that they could um, take the overlapping area, the area that is overlapping between at least four people of the 10. So this is one example. Um, in an educational context in a classroom, it's very easy. You can uh, organize your project in such a way that, for instance, if the project allows it, you can divide your classroom in little groups and they can do, if there are different experiments, they can do every experiment within their group and they can shift. You can actually install a system of rotation uh, within your classroom so they can all do all the experiments, but the experiments will be uh, duplicated or replicated a few times. Um, another example is uh, in the classroom context is the project of Fietsbarometer. It's, it's a Flemish project in Belgium where um, students have uh, been um, logging their uh, biking uh, their biking tour from home to school and they had to um, add to each segment of the street uh, whether they felt safe or not so the replication here is that um, a lot of streets are covered by different students for instance here this this symbol is actually a score for a full school the school gets like at the end of the project the school gets some kind of safety score but what you see is that this school and this school has students coming from here and there is a lot of overlap between like for one segment of a street, perhaps 10 or 15 or 20 students have doing have been doing the same segment. So they are pretty sure that um, yeah, the more data they get, the better. Um, the large sample sizes, uh, just to give an example, GBIF is not a citizen science project, but it's a huge uh, repository for biodiversity data. It already has 1.6 billion observations and it's already um, led to more than 5,000 peer reviewed papers. One of the um, citizen science projects that is feeding GBIF is iNaturalist, and this one has already uh, led to uh, almost 1,200 uh, peer reviewed papers as well. Now, this is not replication stuff. This is just a huge data set. Um, and there are methods called data mining in, with which you can actually uh, filter your data as such that you um, that you avoid uh, having um, a skewed sampling by by coincidence, for instance. Um, in the classroom context, the same thing can be done. The data mining can be uh, can be um, performed and can also be seen as a perfect opportunity to teach data analysis techniques in the classroom and to teach about the importance of good data logging. One of the advantages of a classroom are that uh, you have um, a lot of students in your class, of course, so de facto you have a big um, potential, a big potential for uh, large observation numbers. A little example, Radio Meteor Zoo, the one that I showed just right away on the Zoom First platform has almost run out of data last year, last semester after a few schools had joined the project. So that was a very nice um, observation. Now, when you dive into the protocols, um, normally in citizen science projects, there's always or there is most of the time a, a part um, in which scientists or highly experienced amateurs are uh, correcting the observations that people have done. For instance, in observation.org or the Flemish um, counterpart, Wahrnehmingen.be, people can uh, do an observation, upload a picture, and then the picture of the animal or plant is being checked by an, a highly experienced amateur or a scientist. In a classroom context, you can do the same, but there the teacher gets a big role um, because he can act as a data guard or a reviewer. Um, and that's a very big advantage of a classroom context. A little example, again, Radio Meteor Zoo. 
um, teacher Wim van Buggenhout, who has given a talk yesterday about the Vlinders project and uh, also Brightec. He has developed an educational um, package in which he explained a lot of things to the students. He explained what they had to do. He explained it in the classroom. And then in the end, he let them, first of all, um, analyze at least eight spectrograms per day during one full week. So he made sure that the data that they that they did a lot of uh, analysis and also as a form of uh, quality control, he asked them to make screenshots of what they did on Zooniverse so he could check um, himself whether the, um, the students did the job well or not. So I find this a very nice example for um, for this uh, remedy. And then the last remedy, the educational aspect. Um, as said, every citizen science project uh, has an educational component. At least they have to give a protocol to the people who are joining. Um, most of the citizen science projects currently also have educational content or provide an educational context most of the time on their websites. Um, some projects also give live or online workshops and most of the time there is an, an email address or a phone, you can, a phone number you can call to ask for help. So in a classroom context, again, the teacher has a big role um, because he or she serves as translator or educator for the students. And um, the, it's the, the task of the researcher to teach the teacher in a very nice and, and engaging way so that the teacher can translate it in a, in a good way to the students. Um, another aspect in a classroom context with context which I find very important and which we have learned from the Brightec project is uh, that if possible as a scientist it re it's really really worth to directly meet the students. We've done it well unfortunately due to co uh, Corona our meetings between students and uh, scientists had to be done online but we have seen in all the classes and in all the pilot studies that um, meeting a, like a real scientist in, in real life uh, had a huge effect on the motivation and the level of involvement of the students. So this is also a way in which you can increase your data quality just by engaging with the students directly. So this was a very, very short overview. Um, summarized, you can focus on the numbers by duplicating your observations. Uh, exa for example, having a rotational system in the class, or you can focus on having larger sample sizes, which is also easy to do in a classroom. You can focus on peer review uh, by the teacher, for instance, or you can focus on uh, a very good education and of course the motivation of the students. And um, as a last note, um, you can combine all these techniques and it is up to you, uh, it, up to your choice, which to which one you give most priority. Um, so last slide is just giving the, oops, sorry the um, references of the papers that I cited and here we are. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mickey. We received a couple of comments uh, during your talk about how astronomy is actually a very important element that triggers the uh, matters and students' interest in science, uh, but also uh, some comments uh, related to the teachers we can, uh, who can also act as a researcher. Um, yeah, action research. Um, so feel free to react to that in in, in the chat. Um, and as I what mentioned what mentioned already in the presentation today, some of the opportunities of organizing citizen science in the classroom or to tackle local issues directly at the classroom level, which is a good way to engage students in the learning activities. So linked to this, I'd like to give the floor now to company representatives and, uh, and welcome also Bjorn Batman, STEM Alliance Project Manager at UPenn SchoolNet and Sander Van Lingen, Business Development Manager for Connected Societies and Digital Cities at Dell Technologies. Bjorn, how are you? Hi there, Noel. I'm great. How are you? Good, thank you. Welcome to the event and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And hi there, everyone who's joining us today. It's really a pleasure to see all of these amazing intervention at the at the high level event uh, yesterday and today. And as Noel mentioned, I'm joined today by Xander von Lingen. Xander, uh, how are you? I'm excited. So uh, yeah, let, let's rock and roll. <laughs> great, great. OK, yeah, so um, Sandra and I, we will share today some thoughts and on the reflection and collaboration on local issues. 
And in particular, we will do this by sharing some conclusions and policy recommendations from the STEM Alliance Dell policy hack, which we have concluded uh, yes, uh, last uh, fall in, in summer and fall 2020. And I would just like to uh, give you an overview of the STEM Alliance, uh, the, the project and uh, the policy hack overall. So let me start with some, some introductory remarks here. So what is the STEM Alliance? The STEM Alliance is coordinated by European Schoolnet and it brings together industries, education stakeholders and ministries of education to promote STEM education and careers to young Europeans. Now, the topic of this high level event is citizen science and bringing science to the classroom. And I believe the STEM Alliance really touches upon these topics in terms of active civil society and citizenship. And for this, let me show you some analyses that we did about, well, since the start of this project uh, about 10 years ago. And what we see is that we're facing a certain number of challenges in our societies. So we started 10 years ago with a collaboration uh, with the European Commission, with the University of York and research hubs. And we found that our, trans our society is uh, rapidly changing. There are a number of transformations. So for instance, while the innovation and the rapid change in itself is not a bad thing, but what we do see is that the speed of research and industry innovation is actually moving faster than that of the student skills in secondary and higher education. We also observe that 43% of the EU population lack basic digital skills and the demographics unfortunately do not play in our favor because most of the specialists in the field will retire in the future. And this, of course, hinders the development of critical, responsible and innovative citizens that we need for the digital society of tomorrow and all the challenges that we face in the future, such as climate change, mobility and energy. And at the same time, if we zoom a bit in towards the schools, what we what we face in on the school level, we see that there is a decreasing interest in science, technology, engineering and maths, both in these subjects, in the studies and careers, and the guidance counselors and career advisors, they struggle with this persistent disinterest. In addition to this, we have one out of five students, according to the OECD uh, PISA results uh, from 2019, where we see that one out of five students in Europe is a low achiever in the science and maths. And unfortunately, many teachers are not familiar or are not comfortable with innovative pedagogies for teaching STEM subjects and making STEM education more attractive. So this is what we face on a society level and on a school level. And that is why we believe it's very important to actually start working at an early age because that is when interest in STEM actually develops. Also, it is important to, to make this abstract and very traditional teaching practices in STEM subjects more applicable to real life. So to, to contextualize this with what is happening out there in the real world. And to do this, we believe it's important to work with teachers and career counselors and to equip them with the needed tools to engage students and uh, to, to raise an interest in these subjects. Now, at the STEM Alliance, we do this with 16 industry partners, frontline companies from around the world. And in particular, we have seven key actions that encompass, for instance, professional development for teachers. We also organize and co-organize conferences and online events like this one, the high level event. We have campaigns and competitions, and I will zoom in to, these, uh, to this key action in a minute because that is where the policy hack comes into play. But we also conduct pilot projects, we provide resources, 
we do research and policy recommendations that Sander will present in a minute. And we provide information and uh, overarching topics like diversity and sustainability. Now, I mentioned the campaigns and competitions and twice a year, the STEM Alliance mobilizes thousands of projects, organizations, companies and schools across Europe and around the world to celebrate STEM careers and studies with the STEM discovery campaign and the back to school campaign. And more concretely, last year in summer and fall, we organized the STEM Alliance Dell Policy Hack competition. And that is what I would like to share some information on about right now. So what happened in this competition is that we called for educators and teachers to, to submit their challenges, their STEM education challenges that they face on a local or regional level in their education practices. And not only did we want to hear about their challenges and problems, because this wouldn't be very constructive, but we wanted to see how can ICT actually help solve these problems. And that's why we asked for concrete recommendations. And the participants were able to submit their challenges and their proposals in three themes. So these were STEM education challenges in learning environment and content, in skills and STEM skills, and in lifelong learning. And you see down here a, a, an overview of the competition, and you see that it started last year in August and run until October. That was the time when participants were able to submit their challenges and their proposals, and we really received plenty of amazing submissions, very inspiring. But only four participants were able to participate in the policy hack. And this happened in November. We had a number of brainstorming sessions, and I will explain in a minute what this policy hack is exactly. It's a kind of hackathon type of activity where solutions were discussed from different angles with multiple perspectives. And in the end of November, we had these refined solutions, the proposals being pitched to a jury of expert judges. That was the big finale. And finally, derived from these deliberations and these solution designs, we were happy to publish this spring the policy recommendations that Sander will elaborate on. Now, I mentioned the policy hack is a kind of hackathon type of activity. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with this, a hackathon is an event where you come together to cooperate and work in teams towards a shared goal. And it's a kind of competition. You have different teams working on different topics, in this case, on different challenges and different proposals. And you see here that we invited not only the four finalists that I will introduce to you in a minute, but we also had student representatives. We had ministries of education from around Europe and we had industry partners joining these sessions so that we really had a plethora, like an array of perspectives and multiple angles on how a solution can actually be developed in a viable way. And you see here some screenshots. It really it was an online event, of course, but it really was fun and it was really inspiring to see these ideas and to to see the, the solutions in the end. Now, the four teacher finalists that were part of the, the competition and that were uh, selected based on their submissions for the brainstorming sessions were Stella Magid Podolsky from Israel, Jose Maria Beltran Gomez from Spain, Selçuk Yusuf Arslan from Turkey, who in the end also won this competition. He was chosen by the jury members as the winner, and Anita Shimak from Croatia, who actually took the place of a runner up. And these two submissions on improving social emotional skills with ICT and STEM education and accessible learning environments with hands on experience to meet new school challenges. They were the most convincing. Let's say solutions uh, deemed as most convincing by the jury. 
Now, I would like to share with you the process of these brainstorming sessions, because I think before Sandra actually uh, explains to you in more detail the policy recommendations, I think it's important to explain how these recommendations were formed, because there really was a process behind that. We started the brainstorming sessions with a kickoff and had an ideation phase where the challenges and the proposals by the teachers were explained. And then all the participants in their individual teams actually brainstormed. Then we had a checkpoint where all of the parallel sessions actually got together in a big meeting room. And uh, thanks actually for moving the slide <laughs> indeed. And uh, these were the teacher uh, finalists. And here are the brainstorming sessions. So we had the checkpoint in the big meeting room, and that's where this competition vibe actually came into place because you could see, okay, where are the, the other teams? How far are they? What are their ideas? What can we do to make our solution better? And then we had another session on solution design where these ideas could be refined. We had another checkpoint in the big meeting room, and then we gave participants some time to finalize their ideas. In this process, of course, it was important to be creative, ambitious, of course, re respectful and attentive, but also to have fun. And you see here a uh, like a brainstorming chart on in an online tool where all the ideas were gathered. Then in the end, at the end of November, we had the big finale, and I mentioned that we had a panel of expert judges. And it really was an honor to have Anya Monrad, the Senior Vice President and General Manager at Dell Technologies for Central and Eastern Europe. We had Mark Durando, the Executive Director of European Schoolnet, and Vladimir Garkov from the European Commission for in the Directorate General for Education and Culture. So really expertise there to, to evaluate the proposals on a set of criteria which included, for instance, the relevance of ICT uh, for the STEM education challenge theme, the relevance for the policy recommendation, the feasibility of the solution, and originality, communication, and presentation. So I hope this gave you an overview of what this policy hack was and how the solutions were actually derived in the end. And I'm really excited to hear now from Sander, and I hope you are just as excited, uh, to hear the policy recommendations and the actual conclusions from these uh, processes. Thank you, Bur. So, um, yeah, my, my name is Sander Verlinge. Um, uh, I work as a business development manager at uh, Dell Technologies and I'm focused on, uh, on digital cities. Um, so what I will do is I will show you why this policy hack is important to us. Uh, show you some examples on what we are uh, working on together with our customers and clients uh, and to show you guys how the challenges that we face actually uh, um, match the recommendations from this uh, policy hack. So yes, if we see the next slide, one of our uh, uh, goals at, at at our company is uh, combined in our social uh, um, social impact program, um, where we as Dell, Dell Technology are committed to drive human progress through uh, the knowledge of our people, uh, our technologies, and uh, our global reach. And we focus on four different teams: so advancing sustainability. Uh, cultivating inclusion, transforming lives, and upholding ethics and privacy. And um, if you look at uh, uh, all those themes, we have moonshot goals, something we want to achieve in the next uh, uh, decade. And uh, one of the uh, moonshot goals is the one you see here on the screen, is uh, in the theme transform transforming lives. It's a moonshot goal to reach 1 billion uh, uh, people with our technology and skill um, that we would want to advance health, education and uh, economic opportunities. But in order to, to do so, we need to um, 
uh, get a feeling about what the challenges uh, we uh, uh, really face. So the STEM initiative is one of those initiatives that really gives us a touch base with uh, what, what is happening and it inspires us about uh, the challenges that we uh, really wanna, wanna tackle. So as you see, connecting connecting with partners, that's basically my role. Uh, I get the ins inspiration from, from the STEM initiative, the STEM Alliance, and together with our partners, together with our customers, we look at those challenges and uh, we come together uh, to f find a way to solve these challenges or at least bring a, a, a small piece to the puzzle in solving these worldwide challenges. Um, one of the examples how we do that is uh, working in um, something they call a quadruple helix. So on the next slide, you'll see uh, the definition of a, a quadruple helix, but basically it's um, bringing together uh, citizens, city officials, students and companies to work on these challenges. And uh, on the right side, you see an example of the Urban Living Lab in, in a city in the Netherlands called Breda, where um, um, the, the students are interviewing people within the city to actually gain knowledge about what are the actual challenges, what are the, the things the citizens really want to uh, uh, get solved. Um, by doing interviews, by having uh, uh, presentations or, or workshops. Uh, on the second picture, you'll see how the students work together with the citizens and with city officials to really define these challenges and to work on ideas on how to solve them. And in the third picture, you'll see um, um, city officials and companies coming together to listen to uh, what the, 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 the students and the citizens have defined as challenges um, to have a conversation on how can we collaborate and how can we work on those challenges. So that is, that is uh, one of the pro processes that we uh, support in different cities, uh, just like in the city of uh, Breda. Um, the other thing is um, um, that this is an example of uh, a process, how we work in, um, in, in different cities, but uh, we actually bring technology uh, to the table uh, as well. Um, so uh, the example is in, in uh, Curaçao, which is uh, one of the islands in, in the Caribbean, uh, part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And they were facing a, a challenge on education because most of the people living on the island that really want to uh, educate themselves and, and want to study, they go abroad. So the big challenge for the island is how can we keep those smart people here on the island and how can we create a uh, learning environment or a challenging environment where actually, um, um, well, they, uh, they want to participate in uh, working on the economic development of, of the island. So um, what they did is the university teamed up with the government, uh, asked the government what their challenges were. And one of the big challenges is, uh, uh, is uh, mobility on the island, uh, which is a big part of um, uh, the cost that people have for going to work. Um, so they set up a program together, uh, building a digital twin, that's something they did together with us and with a research uh, company uh, called TNO. Um, and on the right upper hand side, you can see a picture of students working with this digital twin. And this digital twin brings together data, and there are some AI models uh, uh, on the back end, and um, they can predict the digital twin can predict 
uh, the outcome of what if scenarios. So the students were challenged here to help um, uh, the government to come up with new and creative ideas. And on the lower uh, uh, picture, you can see actually the president uh, um, explaining his his um, his uh, ministers and uh, city officials to uh, uh, present the outcome of the student uh, scenario. So them coming together is actually working uh, uh, very well and really excites the people, but also the, stud uh, the students, but also the teachers, because they learn a lot about new digital skills as well. Um, the great thing about this initi initiative is that they've created a broader plan. So it's not just a, one pilot where they uh, come together and, and play with this digital twin. On the next slide, you will see that um, uh, the government actually made a short, mid and long term um, uh, outline, a roadmap. Um, uh, where they actually were looking at what are the benefits for us as a government, for us as uh, Curaçao. And they were also looking at what are the benefits for businesses. So if we can attract businesses to help us and support us, uh, we can jointly work on reaching our long term goal, which is driving economic growth, but also um, uh, meeting the uh, agreements that they've set for uh, um, the, the, the climate changes. So um, I think this is an awesome example of uh, uh, how this, this can be done. So on the next slide, you see a high level overview on how they did something like that. So they are first looking at how can we uh, uh, um, support electric uh, vehicles all the way up to how can we as an island become an export um, uh, or how can we build uh, a business around sustainable energy because there's a lot of sun, there's a lot of wind, there's a lot of water. Um, so they are really looking into sustainable green energies and, and ways to uh, use that as becoming a source of income. So I find this uh, very inspiring. But if we look at the uh, the challenges that they uh, that they face and that we see in most of the uh, uh, these kind of initiatives is that um, you see a lot of smart city initiatives, you see a lot of projects, but they are all scattered around and there's not a specific roadmap. There's not a specific end in mind. Uh, which I believe is very uh, important to uh, raise the interest of the people and to show how important it is to be part of the of the program. Of course, the data is is everywhere uh, uh, that needs to come together, but the same is for the budgets and there are big knowledge gaps between um, uh, students teachers and and uh, government officials. And I really believe that the contribution of companies uh, is very relevant to uh, uh, close that gap or to to help there. Um, basically, what we we really need to look at is how can we bring things together to prevent each and every city or each and every university to re event the wheel again. Let's come together and and make sure that we really accelerate and uh, meet our uh, uh, well digital challenges, but also the, the 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 climate challenges. So the recommendations coming from these these actual projects um, is uh, really uh, make it uh, citizen centric. Uh, collaborate uh, because. By collaboration between students, city officials, uh, uh, the teachers, 
uh, everybody learns from each other. So especially in this COVID situation, most of the times you saw that the students were more capable of using uh, uh, Zoom or Teams or uh, those kind of applications. Uh, and they were actually uh, helping their teachers out. Um, combining those projects into, into programs, collecting data, which is really, really key if you want to do anything with analyzing the data or even uh, with uh, starting uh, uh, to do something with uh, AI. And as mentioned, uh, coming together to speed up. I think those were the recommendations coming from the projects that I'm working on, and they really relate to um, what you will see on, on, on the last slide is the um, uh, recommendations coming from this uh, STEM and, 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 and um, uh, policy hack that we did. So it's really key to provide a learning environment and provide uh, the content which supports the students, the teachers, the re researchers um, to actually uh, get the message across and to, to help each other. Um, as it, uh, it, uh, it also mentions like the skills and, and uh, um, here it says at point six, uh, uh, more the game experience. So the example of using a digital twin really provides uh, people to get their, get hands on um, uh, to work on it and actually have that conversation and that, that social um uh, part of of um uh, using digital technologies uh, uh there as well and at and at the end i believe that it really shows that li uh, lifelong learning is is key um as mentioned the teachers are learning from their students uh in these kinds of projects and together they are uh, transferring their knowledge to city officials and and companies are are supporting that. So um, these these are the recommendations coming from this uh, uh, this policy hack, and underneath you'll see the uh, uh, the link where you can find the full uh, full report. So um, I'm very excited about this, very passionate about this. So if you have questions, don't hesitate. Uh, send me your questions or or send them to to uh, to Bjorn. Um, thanks for your time. Thanks for your attention. And uh, well, looking forward to uh, to answer your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Bjorn, and thank you, Sander, for presenting the results of this uh, policy hack and uh, the policy recommendations that you came up with, also including students in the process. And, and thank you also for sharing these inspiring examples of initiative um, fighting against climate change. This is really important. And as you mentioned, if you if participants today have more questions, so feel they, they should feel free to post a question in the chat. And I, I believe uh, Bjorn or our use and will answer directly there. So in order to contribute further to advancing the discussion around the use and and role of citizen science in the classroom, uh, the Briotech team also initiated the work on a set of recommendations, uh, which aims to evaluate the implementation of the citizen science initiative and tools in the partner countries and provide recommendations for universities, schools and policymakers for the large scale implementation of citizen science activities in the classroom. So in this regard and in order to discuss already this set of draft recommendation, I have the pleasure to welcome Martina Bajorinaite from European School Net will tell you more about this. Martina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Noel, very much for a nice introduction. So yesterday, my colleague Evita spoke about draft recommendations that we came up with for uh, schools and universities. And today I would like to draw your attention to the ones for policymakers. Uh, we provided a few suggestions on how they can enable, support, and uh, finally put the citizen science to the mainstream. Uh, so basically, we have uh, two main recommendations for policymakers. Uh, the first one is to establish government policies to support citizen science, and the second uh, second one is to include citizen science into the policymaking cycle. Uh, 
According to our findings, actually, currently the governmental support to citizen science is provided sporadically and in unstructured ways. In our view, uh, citizen science should be rooted in education and science innovation policies to fully capitalize on the benefits uh, of citizen science activities. We see policies as key enablers for citizen science um, since policies facilitate and set certain education objectives. Uh, moreover, they refer to certain strategies on how to achieve these formulated objectives. These strategies come out in a form of plans and programs uh, resulting in uh, projects, initiatives and campaigns. Uh, finally, all these projects, initiatives and campaigns uh, through policies get means for materialization or in other words are granted funding. So as you can see on the slide, uh, this first recommendation has three key aspects that we want to emphasize. So firstly, through policies, um, citizen science can be legitimized as a valuable scientific practice, bringing various benefits to scientific innovation. Just to name a few, uh, new forms of knowledge uh, generated through the collaboration between uh, citizens and science scientists, um, also uh, increase on, of scientific capacities in the societies, um, involvement of uh, data and scientific methodologies, improvement, sorry, of data and scientific methodologies and the strengthening, uh, the strengthening of co-responsibility and trust among all the parties involved. And relating to this, uh, since in many cases citizen science projects um, contribute to solving a certain local or national level, uh, certain uh, societal issue related to local or national level. Uh, in our view, uh, education and science innovation policies should highlight the good practices of science uh, of citizen science as well as their positive impact on the society or in other words, the policies should uh, emphasize the contribution of citizen science not only to scientific but also to social innovation. And lastly, in our view, stable funding structures are needed to ensure citizen science is it's brought, uh, is brought to its full potential. For this reason, it is essential to allocate budgets to citizen science and reassess current budgets that are allocated for education, uh, science and research. Uh, this is especially important considering the particularities of the citizen science, uh, which usually require more management and communication efforts, as well as more flexible timelines. And timelines are partic particularly fragile in citizen science since it takes time to manage, instruct and maintain communication with students or citizens who usually have to build up their experience in uh, scientific investigation. Uh, and our second recommendation for decision makers is to include citizen science to the policy making cycle. So we recommend that policy makers make use of citizen science projects at different stages of policy making cycle in order to obtain targeted data, uh, which will make them to uh, make informed and data driven decisions. So for, in, uh, for instance, citizen science can provide valuable contributions to policy anticipation or to be used as a source for information gathering. Um, when it comes to uh, policy anticipation, we suggest that uh, decision makers take into account that various citizen science projects can provide valuable data on pressing local or national issue very much in advance or before it gets to the policy agenda. So for this, it is important that policymakers maintain contact with ongoing citizen science projects on local or national level. Moreover, citizen science can be extremely valuable for policymakers to gather large amounts of data with regards to specific issue. As an example, we can actually consider a municipality that wants to address the issue of littering in the city. A citizen science project can help the municipality to collect um, large amounts of information on the areas that particularly uh, suffer from littering. Uh, and 
uh, providing science, uh, insights on the type of littering uh, that is occurring in these uh, particular areas. So based on this information, the municipality board can decide on specific actions, for example, awareness raising campaigns, putting more bins on specific areas and so on. And and now, um, actually, I would like to ask my colleague to share with the link to Mentimeter in the chat. You can use the link to um, the link directly or just go to menti.com and put the code that you can see on the slide. What I would like you to do is actually to reflect on what additional uh, suggestions or recommendations you would have uh, for policymakers. I know that we have a lot of uh, a lot of teachers here, educators, researchers, and other stakeholders related or interested in STEM education and citizen science. So, yeah, let's see uh, what are your uh, what are your insights, and let's um, let's uh, hope uh, that will feed into our uh, final version of of the recommendations. Um, so, I will just give you a few moments to to reflect and to fill in the padlet. Uh, sorry, Mentimeter. Just really don't be shy, take your time to to also to, to think about your own perspective, uh, your organization's perspective. Just see uh, see what additional points you would suggest for policymakers that would uh, help to put uh, citizen science to the mainstream or. Uh, uh, yeah, provide more accessibility to citizen science initiatives, projects and campaigns. We heard a lot of examples actually in those two days of events. So let's give uh, two more minutes to participants to fill in the Menti and then I guess we can share the results. I believe since we had, yeah, sorry, Noel. Uh, yeah, no, I was uh, suggesting that we could maybe move on to the Menti now and see the results okay. uh, directly, if you agree, uh, Martina. Even if uh, uh, all the participants can keep writing and posting on the, on the Menti, uh, even if it's uh, just uh, suggestions or comments on the on the draft recommendations that uh, that Martina mentioned. Yes, that's for sure. Let's uh, see if we already have some some notes for our from our participants um, that might feed. Yes, we have already. Uh, so I see uh, the recommendation to set up roadmaps. Um, bring projects together in programs. Uh, that's a, that's a, indeed a valuable insight. Um, diversify resources. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. The big institutions may have a lot of blink, but the small ones may be equal, equally valuable. Support small scale local organizations and diversify the resources. Diversity is healthy. That's indeed uh, indeed a valuable insight as well, and um, um, that's why we also recommended the policymakers to highlight the uh, the positive impact of citizen science initiatives uh, on the um, uh, on local and 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 the broader national uh, societal context because. Uh, in many cases, citizen science projects deals, uh, deal with uh, solving some uh, issue on a local level. So that for sure needs to be addressed and uh, taken into consideration. Uh, OK, let's see if we have a bit more. I will just refresh the page. 
Uh, just to, to mention again that all these uh, these uh, insights and your feedback will help us to come with the final uh, version of the recommendations for policymakers and also for schools and universities. Uh, we managed actually despite the technical issues to get your feedback yesterday for schools and universities uh, and uh, the the last version the, the final version of the recommendation should be av available in the coming months and uh, be published uh, on the bright tech website okay i will just okay i see we have 30 so i don't think we can go through all of them no we have very active participants uh, martina it's great it will be really helpful for the recommendations that we're working on i believe yes i already see some um by introducing the benefits to the public, yes, that's indeed actually what we also uh, what we also took into consideration when writing the recommendations. But of course, we will emphasize this in more detail because, uh, as Avita mentioned also yesterday, uh, usually uh, the citizen science projects provide uh, benefits to both to science and to to the public as well. So this win win situation, of course, is very very uh, visible in citizen science projects. Thanks a lot, Martina, and thanks to all the participants. I think now it's actually time to wrap up um, today's event. Um, so thanks a lot for all the participants for for sharing your insights on those recommendations and feel free to post uh, via the link uh, more of your suggestions. Uh, now in order to close this, uh, the event, I have the pleasure to welcome Gopal Kutwaru, Vice President of, uh, uh, of uh, Lego Education and Marketing Director. So Gopal, are you with us today? I am. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Okay? Welcome to the event. Thank you for being here with us. Pleasure. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. Um, hello, everybody. Um, it's just incredible to, uh, to see the tremendous work that's gone into the citizen science uh, projects and the thinking, the ideation of that as well, and the work that's being carried out. And it's tremendous to see so much activity happening here as well um, over the last uh, couple of days. And it's been wonderful to, to see that. Um, I'm Gopal Kutwaru, uh, Vice President for Global Mar Marketing for uh, Lego Education. Um, I, I think what I found very interesting in the last couple of days is looking at citizen science in schools in particular um, and looking at looking at it as a way to expose pupils to all steps of scientific inquiry going you know beyond just lab work and uh, data collection but a way of consolidating uh, teachers knowledge of scientific techniques so you know the application of real life science uh, practices uh, uh, you know I think will probably you know drive those huge improvements we like to think within uh, the performance of students in science um, as well as how science works. So in moving on, um, just a few points just to uh, just to close the uh, uh, the, uh, the the session. Um, right. So I can see if I can move this. Uh, if it's possible to move to the next slide, is that? Yeah, that's it. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so um, so I think in closing um, the session, I think it's very, very clear why this whole um, uh, program has been set really um, in the last couple of days. It is about that criticality of bringing research into the classroom, the tremendous value that this really adds to uh, the agenda with STEM. Uh, lots of powerful topics in the last two days, emphasizing, amplifying and driving citizen science. So refreshing to hear um, the audience talk about the different projects and different initiatives and different activities, uh, what's happened before, what's happened now, and also what's going to be uh, going on in the future. And I think with C citizen science and the application uh, of that to children, I think, you know, together, I think everyone uh, on the call uh, here is really helping driving the advancing of a promising future for our children. Uh, at LEGO Education, we do want to ensure that uh, you know children, uh, students um, are future proof um, to the point where you know they are and become confident lifelong learners. We know we're overcoming a tough climate, uh, especially with things like the pandemic and things in the last 12 months, and that's uh, that's been difficult for most of the globe. Um, but what is really 
powerful in the last two days, I think, in, in it, and, and the whole piece around the whole citizen science is really examples, I think, where we're clearly showing resilience, where we are getting on with it, um, where resilience is being showed, re-energization uh, or re-energizing is happening, but through science, the reimagining and the rethinking of what we do today uh, in the world of science and the application of science uh, in terms of citizens and what we're doing with these real life projects is really powerful. So on behalf uh, of the STEM Alliance, um, I'd like to say, um, you know, thank you very much for a fantastic two days um, and very much appreciate your contributions and ongoing contributions uh, to this wonderful initiative. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Gopal, for the for closing this uh, this event with such interesting uh, takeaways for participants. Uh, on my side, I just would like to inform participants that uh, we are working on the report with the recommendation that Martina just presented before, and um, the final version should be published in the coming months on the Brightech platform. So stay tuned about what's coming up soon. And I also want to remind to all the partners of STEM Alliance that they have a closed meeting this afternoon. Uh, starting at 1 p.m. and um, they should uh, follow the instructions sent by email in order to join the event. Uh, and just as a final note, the recording of this online event will be available in the following days on the Bright Tech platform, as well as on Scientix and STEM Alliance portals. And we will send a follow up email with a feedback form to all participants who signed the participants list. So thank you so much to all the presenters of today for your really interesting presentation um, and your support uh, organizing this event. And that's all from my side. It was a pleasure seeing you all uh, online this morning. Have a nice afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for your participation to this event.